Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Salam wa Rasulullah. So today we're going to do having a positive assumption of Allah. There's um, no slides to go with this session, but the notes, inshallah, will be underneath the video. So if you want any of the references, you can find them that way, inshallah. So um, the introduction to this topic of having an a positive assumption of Allah and hoping for his mercy. My Lord, my assumption of you is certain. I have no doubt that it is you who said, I am what my servant thinks of me. So let him think of me what he wishes. If he thinks good, then he will find good. And if he thinks evil, then he will find evil. SubhanAllah. And um, this, this topic actually, or this particular um, verse here, really fits in well with what we study in the Inside Out Paradigm, that that everything, um, you know, everything that we are experiencing of this life comes through thought in the moment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, even our experience of Allah is coming through our own thinking, you know, subhanAllah. So today we'll talk about one of the best and dearest acts of worship to a believer's heart, an act of worship that saves us from all the diseases and sufferings that we, that we could face nowadays. We live in a time where people have lost hope. We've lost hope because of all the failed attempts to change they have experienced, because of all the struggling they go through, because of the many times they've tried to repent but ended up unsuccessful. People have lost hope. And uh, honestly, he, he's so right. And that's why, you know, one of the things that I've been, you know, teaching um, those who are who are doing the certification program with me, many of whom are in the classroom with us right now, that the very, very first thing we have to do when we're working with anyone is instill a sense of hope or invite a sense of hope because we can't instill hope in anybody, but invite people back to a sense of, of hope because when there's no hope, there's no change. When you lose hope, you stop trying. And so hope is always the very first thing, you know, subhanAllah. So when people have lost hope, it, it's like there, there's no movement forward anymore. There's a giving up. So here's what goes, you know, through people's minds, things like, I, you know, I want to be a good person. I want to stop sinning. But what do I do? Every door I knock on stays shut in front of me. Every time I try to change, I find the same result in the end. I'm sick of myself. You know, and this is this is the sort of stuff that's going through people's health um head, you know. I'm sick, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> SubhanAllah. I used to say that all the time. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, subhanAllah. So this is the condition of so many sorry about that bang. There, this is the condition of so many individuals today. And let me tell, tell you, the solution to all of this is in today's act of worship, subhanAllah. The cure is to have a good assumption of Allah and to have hope in him and in his mercy. There's no other way for us um, out of this except having hope and assumption or and assuming the best of Allah. So of it, from those besides Allah, there is no remover. Surah Al-Najm, verse 58. There's no remover other than Allah. Who would be the remover? Remover of doubt, remover of hardship, remover of, you know, all the things that we need removed, subhanAllah. There is no other way except falling to our knees in front of Allah and begging him for help and saying, Oh Lord, I've committed so many sins and I've been away and astray for too long. I've tried to live life my way, but I am living in misery. I am living in bitterness. I don't know how to come back to you and I don't know how to live like everyone around me is living. Oh Lord, my assumption of you is that you will help me. You'll take my hand and bestow your mercy upon you. Oh Lord, my assumption of you is that you will forgive me and you have mercy on me, that you will pardon me. 
Oh Lord, you are Al Afur, the pardoner, the forgiver, and you love to forgive, so forgive. This is one of the du'as we're meant to make on the on the Laylatul Qadr. So also a very good reminder at this point in time. Oh Lord, isn't it you who said, if you were to come to me with the equivalent of the earth of sins, then you met me, not associating any partners with me, then I would meet you with the equivalent to it of forgiveness. O oh Lord, I bear witness that there is no deity that deserves to be worshipped but you. O oh Lord, if I still have the slightest bit of faith and belief in your oneness, then my hope is that you will, that I'll meet you and you will have forgiven all my sins. O oh Lord, isn't it you who said, if you were to come to me, my servant, with the equivalent to the heavens and earths of sins and bad deeds, then ask forgiveness of me, then I would forgive you and I would not care. O oh Lord, I have no one else but you. Forgive the one who has no one else to forgive him but you. Have mercy on the one who has no one else, uh, that who no one else could have mercy upon but you. And you can forgive sins except, who can forgive sins except Allah? In Surah Al-Imran, verse 135. O oh Lord, that is my assumption and hope in you. So don't forsake me, O oh Lord. This is a big dua that the, the Shaykh, um, did you know subhanallah now one of the things that i'm just going to sidetrack on here is there were there were some times in my journey where there was really nothing left um i was physically so broken that my doctor said who's going to look after your children when you die i was emotionally so broken that i had completely shut off emotionally and i was just going about things in, in automatic pilot which is no way to be a mother for three children at that time plus two stepsons you know subhanallah i was just on autopilot because I couldn't turn feelings back on again because I would just get so badly hurt. So I had shut them down completely. And that was just hanging on by a spiritual thread. It was just a spiritual thread that was left. That last Ramadan, because it was a Ramadan, um, you know, just before, you know, I, I had, I had to do something just before the doctor said to me, you know, what are you going to, what, what's your children going to do if you die? I was that sick. I had real, I had curled up in a ball that Ramadan. This was before my um, third child was born. I was just past three months pregnant with her and I was breastfeeding my second child and I was sick with a giardia. It was Ramadan and I was so miserable. I curled up in a ball. And I wanted Allah not to let me wake up the next day. I didn't want to wake up. I wanted to go to sleep and that be it. Now, I would have never taken my life like, uh, you know, I understood too much not, you know, to do that. Even before I was a Muslim, when I really had some very, very dark times, I never was contemplating taking my life. But I was hoping Allah would take it, you know, and we're not meant to do that as a Muslim either. But, um, and I wasn't longing for him. I just had that thought as I went to sleep, wouldn't it be so good if I never woke up again? And, you know, subhanAllah, from there, I just started making dua in every time in my prayer mat and I would cry and I would just say, Allah, help me. I didn't know how to phrase it any other way because I really didn't know what the solution was. I couldn't even imagine a solution. It was all too hard for me. And so after my doctor had said, you know, what are you going to do? I realized I had to do something. So for six weeks, for six weeks, I just prayed into my prayer mat, not knowing what the solution was, just asking Allah for help, knowing that I had to take some drastic action because, you know, I was, you know, on the, the reason my doctor was so worried was I was on maximum asthma medication, but I still was having this sort of asthma attacks where I couldn't breathe. 
And so there were, you know, it was serious. Um, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, um, absolutely gasping uh, for air. SubhanAllah. Um, anyway, after about six weeks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me and it took six weeks. I had to be patient that long. And when you feel like that, six weeks is a long time. Um, what the answer was. And then from there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened door after door after door, all the way to where I am now. You know, subhanAllah. That every step of the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up the next step of the journey. And my job and my only job through all of that was to trust that to trust the doors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was opening up for me that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put before me who was the next person or organization or whatever to help me that that is who I was meant to be listening to right now and there were some moments in my journey where it was kind of like um are we sure that I'm in the right place <laughs> um but even that the that particular well i can share with you what that one was so the what i'm talking about was 2003 um so it was a long time ago 2015 and i'm still on my journey right and i still know that there's something going on with me that is a really holding me back in a big way and so um I was in lots and lots of different internet marketing programs and all the programs that I paid thousands of dollars for always came with a free ticket to their live event. And the live event would always be in the USA and I'm in Australia and I have young children. And so I never ever considered ever attending any of them. But for some strange reason, um, this particular um, time, it popped into my head, I want to go. And I was excited about it. And plus, plus there were a couple of other Muslims that um, were going as well. And I just went bounding into my husband at the time and said, I want to do this. And he said, yes, which was absolutely crazy. And it was only, you know, a matter of a few weeks away. And everything fell into place. Like I, I went, posted to a sister who lived in that area and said, you know, where would be the cheap hotels? I can't afford the hotel that it's in. Um, and she said, come and stay with me. And I stayed with her. And that particular event was a very, very strange event. The sort of thing that I would have never, if I had known what it was, chosen to go. But the fact that I thought it was a three day business workshop related to the business program. In fact, it was actually a three day type of healing workshop because the theory behind it was that if you don't have this healing, then your business won't succeed. Right? So that's why it was part of the business program. And so I have to say that I walked into that room and experienced that first few sessions and I was in culture shock because it was in San Diego and there were people from all different walks of life in there with all sorts of different ideas about life. Many of which were really very, that means they were associating partners with Allah left, right and center. And I'm thinking, really, should I be in this place? But, you know, I had prayed Istakara. I had prayed Istakara from that very first decision of I wanting to go and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had facilitated with ease me being there and it was true I had this massive shift on something huge I had a huge insight into what was holding me back and it was a whole lot of memories about um, some abuse I went through to through as a very at a very very young age and um, I really came out of that event feeling like I'd moved, like I discovered it and moved past it all in that event. So it, it appears to me and Allah knows best that I was meant, you know, to be there. So why I'm telling you this story, because there are times when 
we have to trust the journey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has us on because sometimes it really doesn't look like it should be where you're meant to be. But it was a really key part of my journey. I just kept making dua every time I walked into the room. Oh, Allah, protect my tawheed. <laughs> protect my belief in you, you know, because it, it was it was a little bit um, different for me, that environment. So <clears throat> I wanted to share that, that story because, you know, what has inspired us to do this session, even though we didn't have slides, is because you know, someone is with us who's going through something really challenging right now. And I just wanted to show that having this good assumption and this hope in Allah is just so absolutely critical to our well-being moving forward. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens doors. Whatever we're going through is, you know, part of our growth one of the things i can see now in retrospect and now moving forward i can see it as well is that when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us these big tests it's because he knows number one we can get through it and number two if we pass this test this test is key to us going up to the next level up to the next level in our own selves in our bettering ourselves if we're making dua to Allah, oh, I, Allah, you know, I want to be more patient. I want to be, um, you know, more mindful in prayer. Or we're making these dua to Allah, how we want to be better. Then we need to expect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send the tests into our life that we need in order for us to achieve that. So an example I heard once and I certainly have experienced it myself too, was that, you know, someone was making dua, oh, Allah, give me more patience. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Didn't send the person patience directly, sent the person so many tests that tested their patience so that they had to learn to be patient. SubhanAllah. So, Un understand that these difficulties these challenges these these times when we're really feeling so incredibly tested are often really key to us going to the next level subhanallah which is so beautiful way of looking at it so sorry to have deviated from the path here i just felt that maybe this might be helpful in, in the context of this class alhamdulillah so anyway, let's continue with the actual class. This is the act of worship of having good and positive assumption of Allah and having hope in his mercy. This is what can cure us of our mental illnesses and pain. Do you hear these days about some people, you know, so-and-so got tired of their life and hanged themselves. So-and-so couldn't take it anymore and they killed themselves. And, and you know what? We have this happening even in our ummah, even though we know that if we take our own life, that we have basically sealed our destiny of living um, the way we killed ourselves over and over and over again as our punishment. That, that this is something we do not do in Islam is to take our own life. Because it, if you think about what I just said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden us more than we bear, we can bear, taking our own life means that we are not believing in Allah. We were not believing that Allah will burden, does not burden us with more than we can bear. You know, subhanAllah. So you can see why, you know, taking our own life is so serious in Islam. You know, subhanAllah. So why do you think people do this? It's because this act of worship has escaped from their hearts. And it is a very act of worship that keeps us alive and breathing. We have Allah. Whatever our sins may be, and no matter how many they are, regardless of what our condition is, we have Allah who forgives and pardons. SubhanAllah. So let's take a look at some of the salif regarding this. Sufi and al Thawri said regarding what Allah said about Iblis, about Shaitan. Indeed, 
There is for him no authority over those who have believed and rely upon their Lord. That's from Surah al nahl verse 99. And Sufyan said, this means that he, Shaitan, has no power over them, the believers, to make them commit a sin that is unforgivable. In other words, we need to also believe that. Sometimes we, you know, feel like, um, it, it, like the, uh, trying to think of the, it, it feels like, you know, that, that every which way we look at, you know, we're being pulled away from, from Allah. But the reality is shaitan cannot pull us away if we have firm belief in our heart, subhanAllah. So shaitan could trick us into sinning, but forgiveness is not in his hands. Forgiveness is in no one's hands but Allah's hands, the Lord of the world. The Lord of the world, plural. But a man came to the Prophet ﷺ one time and said, what would you say of someone who has committed all sins and left no sin except that had he had committed it? Is there a repentance for such a man? And the Prophet ﷺ said, have you accepted Islam? And the man said, as for me, then indeed I bear witness there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. And the Prophet ﷺ said, then do good deeds and leave evil ones and Allah will make them all good for you. And the man said, and even my falsities and my obscenities, like my very bad deeds. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, and your falsities and your obscenities. And the man then left the Prophet ﷺ saying, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, la ilaha illallah. Muhammad ibn al Munqadiyah, remember we talked about him in the episode of Bir. He was the one who used to put his face on the ground and ask his mother to step on his cheek. He said, While I was up one night praying, I said to myself, If I knew what the most beloved action to Allah is, then I would do it. He wanted to become sinless. He wanted to constantly be in obedience and worship, always praying, always fasting, always remembering Allah. He wanted to exert all his efforts in pleasing him and never commit sins. Then my eyes beat me. I fell asleep and someone came to me in my dream and said, you want something which cannot be for indeed Allah loves to forgive. It is inevitable that we will commit sins. It is inevitable that we'll have shortcomings. It is inevitable that our deeds will seldom be perfect so that we can always stand with our weakness and humility and submission and tears in front of Allah so that we can reach that degree of love. Allah said, say to whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth, say to Allah. He has decreed upon himself mercy. He will surely assemble you on the day of resurrection about which there is no doubt. In Surah Al-An'am verse 12, Allah has decreed mercy upon himself he decreed that he will have mercy. He decreed that his mercy will always precede his anger and his wrath. The Prophet ﷺ said, By the one whom my soul is in his hands, if you were not to commit sins, then Allah would have taken you and replaced you with people who would sin. Then they would ask forgiveness of Allah. Then he would forgive them. And this is a Sahih Hadith, um, Muslim Hadith. Awan ibn Abdullah said regarding the verse, and you were on the edge of a pit of fire and he saved you from it in Surah Al-Imran verse 103. He said, indeed, I hope that he, Allah, would not return you to it, the fire, after he has saved you from it. That is what we think of Allah. Abu Uthman, Ahnadi used to say mercy was created for sins. Some people said we have never seen anyone who wishes the best for the Muslims more than Ibn Aun al Hajjaj. A very oppressive Muslim leader was mentioned in front of him, and Ibn Aun was told, They claim that you ask forgiveness for al Hajjaj. So Ibn Aun said, And why shouldn't I ask forgiveness for him? What is between me and him? I wouldn't mind asking forgiveness for him even. For one whole hour, 
And this reminds me, you know, oh, subhanAllah, just recently in the, the Christchurch attacks, how beautifully one husband and one wife who lost their spouse and the wife lost her son as well in the attacks, how they sought forgiveness for the attacker. SubhanAllah. You know, this, this is the way of a Muslim. And I, I've got to be honest, sisters, you know, SubhanAllah, I, I do these workshops in schools as part of um, a multi-faith um, values type of workshops with kids. So we're coming together showing that basically it doesn't matter, you know, what our religious background is, that when it comes to core values, we're all the same, but that there are other values we have that are slightly different, but that doesn't matter because the core values are the same. This is kind of the idea anyway. The more I listen to people from other faiths, the more I feel so blessed that we have this understanding because we have one activity do, we do, which is the, like the values activity where we ask different questions and they have to stand, the kids and us adults as well, stand somewhere on, on the timeline between, or on a line between zero and 10 on what's important. And we ask the question, is it important to forgive, right? And in all religions, in all religions, it's important to forgive, right? But it's only ever the Muslims that are so convinced of this you'll see everybody else further down the line and when asked why they're standing where they're standing it's because oh if if this person has hurt me they don't for, deserve forgiveness or you know there's so many so much thinking there and yet for us muslims it's like it's it's for us to forgive we, we, we have so much faith in Allah's justice in the end that we can forgive. And they don't have that faith in Allah's justice. Like, it's, you know, when, when now when I do Surah Al-Fatiha and, you know, the last verse where, you know, those who, who went astray and those who earned Allah's anger, meaning the Christians and the Jews, more and more I see the meaning of that verse. The Christians, I can see that they've gone astray. And the Jews, I can see why they have angered Allah, subhanAllah, in, in some, of, some of the things that I, I start learning, you know, subhanAllah, in, in being a part of this. So it makes sense to me. You know, we ask forgiveness. Because when we ask forgiveness for someone who may have harmed us or harmed the Muslims, then our heart softens towards them and then we can forgive them ourselves. And for us, forgiving them ourselves is actually to free our heart from the rancor and the hurt and whatever's going on in our heart. It's not for them at all because they care less sometimes whether we forgive them or not. The forgiveness is for our own selves. And Allah knows that. Allah knows that we need to forgive others in order for us to have that peace in our heart. And that's why it's so important. SubhanAllah. So, um, you know, I love, I love this answer, you know, from Ibn Awan because we just don't know what we're capable of doing you know, in, in a moment where maybe emotionally we're not doing well, that, that how can we go around judging others? We haven't got time to judge others. We need, this is actually tomorrow's class, isn't it? We need to be just judging ourselves. Let's move on with today's class. <laughs> it's interesting how they start weaving together the different, different lessons that we're learning. Muawiyah ibn Qura said, I wouldn't accept the whole world and what it contains in exchange for these verses. And asking them, what put you into saqa? They will say, we were not of those who prayed, nor did we use to feed the poor. 
and we used to enter into vain discourse and with those who engaged in it and we used to deny the day of recompense in surah al mudathir verses 42 to 46 don't you see that there is no good in them he meant that alhamdulillah inshallah we are people who pray pray and give charity alhamdulillah we believe in the last day so we will not be of those people inshallah why don't we see these verses in that sense as well why do we always think of the contrary these verses should cause us to love allah but never be proud or arrogant and transgress awan ibn abdullah also said indeed it is the most arrogance of arrogance to wait for the completion of wishes while you O servant are disobedient subhanallah <laughs> So, you know, we make dua, I want this, I want that, I want this, but I'm just going to commit this sin and that sin and that sin. You know, subhanAllah, you know, it's like um, one of the things that came up in the workshop yesterday too, it's, it's that balance, you know, we ask Allah, but we also have to take actions. And some of the actions are we have to move towards what we're making dua for. Some of the other actions are, we need to be looking at ourselves and go, well, what am I doing? I need to ask forgiveness for, what am I doing? I need to repent for, to be worthy of these du'as being answered, you know, subhanAllah. So there's, there's action involved in our du'a. It's not just something that we say, there is action that follows as well, subhanAllah. This is the saying of Ibn Aun, one of the most, uh, the people, to have hope in Allah's mercy. So beware of being arrogant, beware of committing sins continuously and saying, oh, Allah is merciful, he'll forgive me. Because this isn't the right attitude, is it? This isn't having the right intentions. Rather say, I do commit sins and I want to repent. Oh, Allah, accept my repentance. But I am still weak. Oh, Allah, strengthen me, help me, provide me with the power to overcome this sin and never do it again. And we all commit sins, you know, subhanAllah, the more we go through these lessons, these worshipper series, the more I see in myself, oh, mostly it's the slip ups of the tongue, you know, subhanAllah, this tongue, I can understand why, I think it was Abu Bakr one day, they saw him and he's holding his tongue and they're asking him, you know, why are you holding your tongue? And he's saying, because this tongue is like, you know, it's... <laughs> doing the wrong thing all the time you know and i feel that way too you know subhanallah in reflection it's like how could i have said that how could i have gone down that path and i know why i know why when i when my tongue is is running amok is when i'm not on track emotionally subhanallah it's always a great sign for me to to realize that you know hang on a minute I'm not seeing it. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, you know, not, not in the right state of mind at the moment. Subhanallah. All right. Um, so security, our security is with Allah. He called himself Al Mu'min, the secure, because he secures and saves us from punishment. Allah is the most generous. His hands are always giving day and night. So how do I have a positive assumption of Allah and hope in his mercy? It's always important in these classes that we get the how. Because so many times we get the theory, we walk away and we go, yeah, but how? Come on, don't leave me hanging here. Alhamdulillah, this Sheikh gives us the how. Alhamdulillah. Always remind yourself of the meaning of hope. Remind yourself of Allah's beautiful attribute, Al Afur, the pardoner, Al Ghafur, the forgiver, Al Rahim, the compassionate, Al Tawab, the one who accepts repentance. Never let shaitan make you lose hope in Allah's mercy. Tell him, Go away, O cursed one. I want the Lord of the worlds, and my Lord will not forsake me. But be careful not to be deceiving yourself. Never be deceiving with Allah. For whoever deceives Allah, Allah will deceive them. So I'm dressing a poor person who is sick of sinning and wants to repent but doesn't know how to. I'm telling this person, remember these beautiful meanings of Allah's names and remember his mercy. Right now you might look and feel like someone who is destined for the hellfire, but remember, indeed a man 
would do the actions of the people of hell until there was a distance of only one dira or arm's length between him and hell then the decree of the book would precede him and he would do the actions of the people of jannah and enter into it never despair indeed no one despairs of relief of allah except the disbelieving people surah to yusuf verse 87 have hope sufyan athari said about allah's words and do good indeed allah loves the doers of good in surah to baqarah 195 this means that you shouldn't die except while having good assumption of allah and hoping for his mercy Al Hassan, may Allah have mercy on him, stood on the grave of Waqi and said, Oh Allah, have mercy on Waqi, for surely your mercy cannot come short of Waqi. Let us say this dua as well. Oh Allah, have mercy on. <laughs> this is, this is um, uh, Sheikh Haini Halmi's class, right? And he said, Oh Allah, have mercy on Haini, the Sheikh, for surely your mercy cannot come short of Haini. So actually, why not? Why not? It's because of this Sheikh that we have these beautiful classes. So, you know, Allah, I ask Allah to have mercy on Haini. And I ask Allah to have mercy on Sister Alia for giving us this opportunity to know these beautiful lessons in English. Because without her contribution, they would only be in Arabic and we wouldn't have access to this, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on all of us here, each and every one of us listening here. For surely your mercy cannot come short of each and every one of us. Think good of Allah and remember these meanings. The second one is always have certain wish or hope from Allah. So picture this scene, uh, this scene not sin, scene. It was reported in the book of al Hilya by Mahul that there was a pious woman called al Faria bint al Mustaurid, who was up worshipping Allah when she saw Iblis, Shaitan prostrating on the Mount of Safa with tears flowing down his cheeks. So she asked him, O oh, Iblis, what will extended prostration bring to you? He said, I hope that if he accepts my oath and he will take me out of the fire. So Iblis, Shaitan, has hope in Allah, and he is the cursed and cast away one. SubhanAllah. So then us are much more worthy of having hope in Allah than Shaitan, right? SubhanAllah. In the book of Safwat al-Safwa, it is mentioned that Yusuf ibn al-Hussein was seen in a dream, and he was asked, what has been done to you? And he said, my Lord has forgiven me and he's bestowed mercy upon me. And he was asked, with what? What did he forgive you? He said, because of a word or some words that I uttered at the time of death. Oh Allah, I have advised people by words and betrayed myself by actions. So exchange my betrayal by actions with my sincere advice by words. SubhanAllah, this is so important because so often... You know, subhanAllah, there's a terrible, terrible, terrible punishment for those who uh, talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And I can't remember the exact details of it. Probably I tried to block it out because I didn't want to think about it. Because when you put yourself in this, the shoes that I put myself in by standing here teaching you this, is I put myself in a position of, of potentially earning that punishment if I don't walk the walk. And of course, I'm human. And there are many times when what I'm sharing, I'm not doing it myself. SubhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me and guide me and give me the strength to always be able to live up to what I am sharing with you. But here, um, this is such a beautiful dua, you know, that I advised the people by words and betrayed myself by actions. So exchange my betrayal by actions with my sincere advice by words. And if Allah accepts it, like that's potentially gets you away from that punishment. Alhamdulillah. Yes, by Allah. And we, all of us are the ones who should say this. So I'm saying this to myself. The Sheikh was in the, the actual lesson is saying it to himself, but I'm saying it to myself too. SubhanAllah. Amar ibn Saif said, 
I saw Al Hassan ibn Sahih in my dreams after he had died. So I asked him, I'm longing to meet you. So tell me what news have you? And he said, I haven't seen anything like having a good assumption of Allah. So now let me ask you, what do you think of Allah? What is your thought about the Lord of the worlds? Surah Safat verse 87. Allah actually asks us this. What is our thinking of Allah? Remember what we started this whole class is? I am what my servant thinks of me. So what is your thinking of Allah? Question yourself, sisters. What is your thinking of Allah? Because Allah will be for you as you think of him. SubhanAllah. And that doesn't mean that Allah is changing. Staffaralladin. It means we are limiting ourselves and our relationship with Allah through our own thinking. Allah is always there. SubhanAllah. So what do you think of Allah? The sign of having a good assumption of Allah is performing good actions. If you really have hope in Allah's mercy and think that inshallah he will forgive you, then you would want to do everything that's possible to please him. You would want to seek all means of forgiveness. If you are certain that Allah is a tawab and that he will accept your repentance, you would rush immediately and fulfill the conditions of tawbah, repentance. You would feel sorry for what you did. Decide and sincerely never to do it again and start doing as many good deeds as you can. If you knew that Allah is al-afur, the pardoner, and that he loves to forgive and pardon, then you would run and hasten and do anything you could to make him forgive you. That is my advice to you on how to achieve that calm and serenity in your hearts through this wonderful act of worship, having hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, do not let us die until we have the best assumption of you, O oh Lord. O oh Allah, accept from us our deeds and accept our repentance. You are the most merciful, the compassionate, the acceptor of repentance. O oh Allah, do not let my tongue and words be all my good deeds to you. May you remember what I said to you and I put all matters in the hands of Allah. Sapanaka lahuma wa bahamdika shida la ila ila anta stafaruka wa tubu alaik. Subhanallah, what a powerful session. I'm going to come back and see what your thoughts were of that. Subhanallah. All right. Um, I just had this horrible thought. Maybe. I didn't record, but I did. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> that would have been awful if I didn't record that one. Alhamdulillah. All right. So tell me, what are your takeaways? Let me just do the whole allow you to unmute yourselves thing. Mm. Can I go? Guys, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so my takeaway is we should learn the names of Allah and get to know him as much as we can so we can think um, positive about Allah. Yeah. I've been having that realisation. Um, you know, we're always told that. But yeah, but it doesn't make, it, like, where does that make that as much sense? As <laughs> yeah, but I must say this Ramadan... Um, the names of Allah has been something that's been coming to me for mm. some reason as well. Um, Same. SubhanAllah, like, um, I'm not sure why, but I just see some awe every time I look at one of the new names and really think about what it, not, not new names, they're new to me, I mean, like, the names, SubhanAllah. So probably the next step for me too, um, and I never paid attention to them because I couldn't understand, but I think I'm ready now. And it's coming, it keeps coming as well in everything. And these classes, they have a name every time. Yeah. So, inshallah, I think that's the next step. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Awesome. Jazakallah for your takeaway, Romy. Amal, what's your takeaway, sis? Well... I've been in the past also um, thinking about forgiveness that looking at it that I'll forgive so that Allah forgive me. So, so yani, be kind to others so that Allah be kind to you. So um, 
I met some people made it so hard for me. They uh, maybe it was a test from Allah, Allah, I don't know, but it was like they are not forgiving. They, any, anything I do, even I, I, uh, my intention is not to, to hurt them or anything. I don't have any intention, but they take it like um, something um, they, 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 that hurt them and they try to uh, get back on me to yeah so amel can i can i stop you there not uh -huh. not because i um i hear what you're saying but b because i want to share something with you that's really important about what you just said yeah you're focusing on them forgiving you right them forgiving you is between them and allah if they don't forgive you the only person they're harming is themselves it's not about them forgiving you. It's all about how we forgive others. So it's all about you finding the place in your heart to forgive them, whether they forgive you or not, or whether you even feel like there was anything that they should be giving, forgiving you for, or whether it's being unjust that they think that way of you. This is only going to hold them back, not you. If I forgive everybody, Sister Catherine, that's yeah. the question that I kept answer. I forgive everybody, and everybody is holding something against me. That the day of judgment, he will or she will come and point it out. I want from her good deeds. I want from her good deeds. So, but you see, a I lot if they if they're ah, you see, now you're worrying about them taking your good deeds, right? Yeah, because they're not forgiving me. Okay, you're getting things confused here. Because, because if you have, if you have sought their forgiveness, if you have repented to Allah, if you have done all your bit, all right, then you are free from that. And the only thing that's a, that's happening if they're not forgiving you is they're harming themselves because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is with, is withholding forgiveness of them until they let go of those feelings of you and on the day of judgment he's not going to be unjust and make you hand over your good deeds to them just because they couldn't find it in their heart to forgive you it doesn't work like that Amal your good deeds are safe providing you repent you do what you can to um do restitution if there is a, if you transgress someone's limits you do your best to fix that and you repent to allah and you cease doing that um and you do good deeds to follow it up and you've asked their forgiveness you've done everything you have to do and your good deeds are safe from them so you don't need to get them. So this is one thing that, you know, we teach in, in um, our mas mastermind. Remember the classes on separate realities, Amal? If you go back to the, go back and listen to the separate realities recordings. Um, separate realities are that um, everybody is going to perceive things through their own thought through their own thinking, through all the filters, the experiences, everything they've been through. Mm -hmm. You cannot get into someone else's head and change the way they think about things. You can try and influence their thinking. You can try and inspire them to think differently, but you cannot change it unless they change themselves, right? So it would be unjust if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us accountable on what's going on in the heads of others, because we have no control over that. We only have control over ourselves. And so this whole class is about having the hope that Allah can, can forgive us. And in order to get that forgiveness, what do we need to do? We need to um, own up with Allah, not with people, with Allah, to our sins. 
repent for them, make restitution if we've harmed others, and follow up with good deeds, but genuinely repent and have the intention to do our best not to go back to those things. And so if we've done that, and we have hope in Allah's mercy that he will forgive us, most likely, inshallah, we will be forgiven. And so you have nothing to worry about to do with your good deeds. There was another thing that popped into my head and it just slipped out that I wanted to connect with that. Hang on. Um, ah, yes, that was it. The other thing I want you to think about is when we're dealing with people who are unfair, right? Mm -hmm. They will describe our actions as if we've committed a sin when sometimes we haven't even committed a sin. And if we're not clear in our thinking, we kind of think maybe we have. And so we walk around feeling like, oh, I've transgressed this person's limits when you haven't at all. Because pe these people are people who are making us responsible for their feelings. And if we've done something or said something and their feelings, then they're having hurt feelings. They're blaming us for it, right? If we have not done anything that is displeasing to Allah, if our words were respectful, if our actions were respectful, if we did not transgress their limits in terms of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects of us and they have hurt feelings, we have not committed a sin that we need forgiveness for. Okay. And I think a little bit of what you're taking on Amal is people's um, injustice and oppression where they're saying, Oh, you did this to me because they're having hurt feelings. But the reality is those hurt feelings are coming from their own thinking. It didn't come from your actions. It didn't come from your words. And so your fear of your good deeds is un unfounded. Hmm. This whole lecture gives you hope that doesn't matter whether those people in your life never forgive you and they always remain angry with you or upset with you or whatever, that you can still be forgiven from Allah and that your good deeds will be safe on the day of judgment. Unless, of course, you do slip up and you do something, then you just fix it through repenting. Okay, does this make more sense now? Yeah, this makes more, more sense. Yeah, so you are free. You are free from their their mixed up thinking. I mean, I've been having so many lessons recently about this separate realities. It's so crazy, but everybody makes weird assumptions of me lately. And I can see the separate reality so much. Even, even my daughter said something profound to me the other day. And I went, where did you ever get that idea from? She said to me, like, I know, she said something along the lines, I know, Umi, you just want me to get married to some a strange person from another country doesn't speak English, but I don't think I could handle that. And I looked at it and I went, where did you ever get that idea from? I said, I warn all the convert sisters not to do that. Why would I then do that to my own daughter? Where did you get this idea from? Like people have all these assumptions of me and I go, subhanAllah, these separate realities. Like it's like things that are so bizarre to me, they think of me. But, you know, alhamdulillah, I don't have to, I, I fixed that one with her. I said, look, <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. Besides, you're only 16. I'm not even thinking about getting you married yet. <laughs> Subhanallah. Ah. <laughs> so, Amal, I think what's going on for you that's causing you a lot of grief and a lot of stress is getting some of these things a bit confused and thinking that, you so i know that it's hard when it's your close ties of kinship because mm -hmm. it's yes we have in our religion that we need to you know do our best to please our parents and you know please the the people who are our ties of kinship right but mm -hmm. it's not in our power to actually please them the point is our job 
is to do our best to please them by showing up in the way that Allah is pleased in our relationship with them. If they are not pleased, that's not in our hands. Our job is to just do our best. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense now? Yes, it makes sense. If they're not pleased, that doesn't make you accountable for that. That's mm -hmm. their thinking that is yeah. having mixed up thinking and they may never shift that thinking. Yeah. Actually, subhanAllah, يعني, what hurted me more, it's about the Eid. When we have the habit, when it is Eid time, you greet people and you congratulate them with the Eid and then you tell them, forgive me. Mm. And, uh, and, and uh, just for any un, un, you know, unintentional thing, just forgiveness. Yeah. And then, yeah. So, so some people they seek, they seek it, and then I go, I forgive you for anything I did to you, and and they intentionally, I know they intentionally harm me, but at the same time I tell them back, forgive me too. They tend to keep quiet. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not forgiving <laughs> you, but this was what. <laughs> so it so was, don't, it doesn't matter yeah. you. You've done what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from one of my teachers many, many, many years ago when we were learned, we were doing, going through the hadiths in Riyadh Salahim. And in there is the hadith about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholding the forgiveness of two people who have rancor in their heart with one another until they forgive each other. Right. Yeah. And so the question came up, well, what if I forgive them and I seek their forgiveness and they don't forgive me? Does that mean I am still held by that? And the teacher I had said, no, you've done your part. You've done your bit. So you are free from it. But the other person who's still holding on to it is not. So they're only harming their own selves, which again mm -hmm. makes us sad if they're our close family because mm -hmm. you know we feel sad that they're not seeking Allah's forgiveness or well, my family don't even believe in Allah so they wouldn't seek his forgiveness but I'm talking in terms of your Muslim family mm -hmm. that you know it would be feel hard that you know I wish they would understand this and you know forgive me not for me but for their own selves because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. their soul that is being hurt by not forgiving you, not yours. Yours is free. If you've forgiven them and you've asked their forgiveness and you've repented, if you ever did anything wrong in the first place, I suspect, Amal, you've taken on the blame for a lot of things that really weren't even um, something wrong um, because I, I'm, you know, I've worked with you for a while now. I, I understand the situation quite well. And abusive mm -hmm. people, I'm afraid, they, they, put, they lay all this responsibility on you and and like you feel like you have the worst relationship with Allah because you've done all these things wrong when you haven't actually. Mm -hmm. To this day, to this day, um, my ex will still come up with reasons why everything was my fault. But I don't walk around feeling heavy that Allah's not going to forgive me because he thinks that way because I know his, his thinking is delusional. <laughs> mm. Alhamdulillah, you know, Alhamdulillah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the clarity to see these. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. Did that help, Amal? Did that help? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. For Why, yeah. for taking time. No, no, I think that this is a very good topic because mm -hmm. it is kind of related to what we're talking about. And I do think that this is a place where people get stuck because they think, well, if someone hasn't forgiven me, then that's holding me back. Yes. But that wouldn't be just and fair, would it? Yes. That's why I was mad. <laughs> yeah. Because, because I know that if I did something to somebody and uh, I asked forgiveness and didn't forgive me and the day of judgment, I will come face to face with that person. As Allah said, you know, so there is no way out of it, you know. So <laughs> No, but you see that doesn't that's not befitting of how you know of Allah's mercy, is it? Yes. So when something's not befitting, then we need to start going, hang on a minute, there must be something about this I'm not understanding properly. 
Yes. Our job in this life is to please Allah as best we can, to rectify our mistakes as best we can and repent for them. And just always be thinking in terms of, am I pleasing Allah in what I do? And if I'm not, I need to fix that. And do our best to please people, but understand that some people can't be pleased. Yeah. 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 Waiyaki. So Daniela had to go. She said her takeaway is Allah is to us how we think of him. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, having an understanding of the inside out paradigm really gives us a clear understanding of our own selves and our thinking. It brings us so much closer to him. And again, knowing Allah's names and using his different names is very key. This Ramadan, it's amazing. Probably haven't worded how I exactly wanted to as I'm listening at the same time too. But inshallah, you get what I mean. <laughs> that sounds so much like Tani the way. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right. Um, Charmaine, what's your takeaway today? Assalamu alaikum. Welcome. Um, oh, um, what is my takeaway today? Um, I guess. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test us and he tells us with our wealth and health and mm. you know, so many things. But the beauty of Islam is that um, we have all the, the solutions, so we just have to seek them. Mm. And um, it is, uh, you know, it is such a comprehensive religion. I mean, we're, sometimes we just say these words, Islam is this and this. But like it really, really is, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Muslims know that. So, um, yeah, and just always, uh, you know, trying opportunities to connect with Allah to, um, you know, to know Him better, and um, and yeah, and it's all it is all about us, though, isn't it? You know, like we shouldn't be worrying about others. Me, and we do, but but when it becomes that connection between, you know, me and Allah, you know, that's, you know, that is the most important thing. So, yeah, good lesson again. All right, Homer, I left you last on purpose because I wanted to, like, save the last with you to see how you're doing now. That definitely, that definitely helped. I think for me, my, I just get overwhelmed with my emotions and it takes over and I, and I can't, they come and I can't control it. And then I just, I don't know, I get lost in all the, the thoughts and, and the thoughts are just, I don't know, maybe harsh very harsh or maybe I'm just used to hearing abusive critique so now that's how I think and so are you being harsh on yourself is that what you're saying in this situation I don't think it's necessarily that it's just I have the knowledge I know I know that Allah is merciful I know he doesn't burden us with more than we can bear but having that knowledge doesn't change my my thoughts mm -hmm. so that's that's really where I struggle and I know it's a test and I know it's the end of Ramadan and I should you know feel glad that I'm being given this trial but it's just it, it's not just this one incident there was something that happened before it so I'm I was already you know on one leg going into this so just thinking about these two things juggling them back and forth in my head and one is about family and so obviously that <laughs> strikes a nerve mm -hmm. so I think I, I don't know I just I don't know how to channel the thoughts or <sighs> so let, let me let me share something with you um there's knowing and there's knowing <laughs> <laughs> got it <laughs> and so far, you've got the first level of knowing, which is like the intellectual knowing. 
Like we right. intellectually know these things, but just yeah. like Romy was saying about her takeaway about the names of Allah, like we know the names of Allah, but then it's like now we're getting to know the names of Allah. Mm -hmm. It's that internalization of that knowledge, that knowledge yeah. becoming part of who you are. Mm -hmm. And that happens and it happens according to Allah's plan, not according to your plan. So why you keep trying to make these things happen and trying to fix things, mm -hmm. you are actually working within your own intellect. Mm -hmm. And if our own intellect had been enough, we would have figured it out by now. And it's not. You've got to let go of all this kind of trying to figure it out and really sink into trusting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to show this to you. But it's going to be when, when he knows you're ready to see, see it because there are implications with seeing it. When you see it, there's several implications. One is you become more accountable. Um, and so you have to be ready. Um, the other is that you start showing up differently in your life. And so that can interrupt relationships in your life a little because you may become more confident um, and reassured in your decision making and your direction in your life and people around you who have wanted to control that get unsettled by those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, and we all have controlling people of some kind in our life. And, and the reason for that is because controlling behavior comes from insecurity and there's a lot of insecure right. people. It's not yeah. that they're bad people or mean people or even really controlling people. They're actually got insecure thinking, which is leading mm -hmm. them to believe they have to control the things in their life or the people in right. their life. Ow, ow. Be okay. <laughs> and so what ow. happens is I'll just mute you for a moment. Um, what happens is, as you start to internalize and really truly understand not just the inside out paradigm, but all these principles that we're learning in these classes, you become more confident and assured and uh, you, you have more clarity. Um, you can see the criterion um, of right and wrong. You can like, you can see, what's pleasing to Allah and what's not pleasing to Allah. And this clarity leads you to a conviction and a real conviction to heading in a particular direction or leading your life in a particular way. Because you can see now, okay, this is what is more pleasing to Allah. Now the people around you who feel insecure and want to control things get quite unsettled by that. Because now it's like you're not behaving the way they're used to. And so it throws out their whole plan of controlling everything so they'll be okay, right? So when people are less okay, they try to be more controlling or they might get more angry. Um, lots of things can happen, right? So the, um, the thing, the reason I'm telling you all this is because you internalizing this, you actually really knowing this knowledge is going to be when Allah knows you're ready to handle all that. And so it's not about you sitting here and trying to figure it out because if you're not ready to have it figured out, then Allah's not going to bless you with that insight yet because he knows that you, you won't handle it. You, it won't, be a good thing for you. It might make things, you know, harder, right? That and you can't, and so, as he won't burden us with more than we can bear. So your job in this journey is not to try and figure it out, but to just keep listening, and keep contemplating, and keep reflecting, and and just sort of going, oh, what does that mean? And see what it means, and see how it fits, right? But don't be trying to go, okay, I have to fix this or my thinking's stuck here, so I have to fix that or I need to control my feelings here because there I'm not doing good with that. The more we think like that, the more we're holding ourselves back because we don't actually have the answers. Allah has the answers. 
So does that make sense, Homer? It does. I get, I get overwhelmed when there's a lot of emotions. Yeah. So, quite honestly, I don't know what I'm doing or what I'm thinking if I'm, if I'm actually trying to fix it or not. All I know is that, you know, someone my, you know, someone said something very hurtful and I just, I can't stop thinking about it and it burns me every time I think about it. And what am I going to say back to him and how am I going to fix this? And what, what's going to happen when I see each, we see each other and just kind of cause all this, you know, drama and, and it just keeps going and going and going. Yep. It keeps going as long as you keep thinking about it. I'm, and and I don't think I understand the inside out paradigm then because I don't know how to be at peace with that. You know what? Because you, you're just at the beginning of your journey in the inside out paradigm. You haven't even been to any of our group sessions yet because you've just joined. So don't give yourself a hard time. I first really started, I, I sort of got things, like I first started the inside out paradigm years before I even realized that's what I started. I didn't get it at all, walked away from it. And then I came across it again and again. I went through module one and went, ah, and walked away from it, right? And then six months later, I started listening to the Ramadan Transformations recordings. And then I started to go, oh, okay, kind of get this a little bit. And some things shifted, right? And then I thought I got it. I thought I was so cool. I thought, oh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> This is like three months in. So I'm talking about three months in. You're not even three months in yet, right? And I was thinking, oh, yeah, I've got this. I get this. Oh, this is so cool because I was at a live event in London. In So this was in July was the Ramadan transformations in October. I'm walking around like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The following May, so that was like, what, eight months into my journey. Bang, Allah hit me with all the insights. And it was like, oh, wow. You know, I had two massive moments of insights that shifted everything. And that was like eight or nine months into my journey, right? So you're just at the beginning. It's quite okay that you don't get it yet. Absolutely okay that you don't get it yet. Alhamdulillah. All right. Still, yeah, I'm still feeling that's, lost. That's why we do a 12-month mastermind is because I want to make sure by the end of it, you do get it. Okay. All right, so just relax. We've got lots of time on our hands to make this happen. Romy's laughing because she's been on this journey with me for a while now. Yeah. You want to share anything, Romy, that might help Homer in her thinking around what? what uh, this please. <laughs> uh, no, when she was talking, now I could pick up that she's going to the future a lot and trying to figure out what in the future when that's from Allah. We can't really. Um, and from my journey, yeah, it takes time. I just feel like now this Ramadan has been like amazing. I could see it's everything from a different point of view or perspective and it's just, but it just happens. You don't have to worry about it. You've just got to stay on the journey, don't you, Romy? Yeah. And it yeah. all just starts to unravel. Yeah, because see, if it was all in one go, it's too much. You know, it's just, give. you know, it has this time and Allah knows and maybe the test comes just for you to change, to just shift that little bit that you need to, you know, go to the next level. But just take it easy, inshallah. So for me, um, you know, alhamdulillah, I feel quite blessed that Allah b believes I'm strong enough to handle the tests he sends me because he sends me some pretty tough tests, alhamdulillah. So when I had the massive insights that changed everything for me, the domino effect from that was massive. Like I had huge falls outs in my family that we're still trying to pull together. So that was 2016. We're in 2019. It, what is it? May now. So we're talking about three years, three years in those relationships. So we're still figuring it out. You know, it, it had a huge impact in my family because what I came to realize was how many, like the reason I was struggling was there was so many trying to control me. And I was in this, I was the, in the middle of a tug of war of everybody pulling me in every direction. And when I had my insight, I kind of went back off everyone. I don't want to be controlled by anyone anymore. And, and that kind of had this massive impact on all my relationships. <laughs> it was like <laughs> huge. Um, and 
many of the people involved still have stories around all of that. Like um, in all of this, one of my brothers is still not talking to me, even though I've reached out to him and I keep reaching out to my other brother. My other brother replies back, but fobs me off. Like I tried when I was in Sydney to go and see him. They, oh, I'm too busy. Like they don't want to have anything to do with me because they feel like I've done something to them, but I never did anything. In fact, I know I did it with one of my brothers because I never spoke to him to have done anything, right? He's got all this thinking going on based on what other people have said. So it's all hearsay. Um, and yeah, so it, so there's a lot of relationships that are still in a mess. I'm still reaching out, but I'm getting nothing back. Um, I've been told by people in the family, it's my responsibility to fix these relationships when I don't even know what the problem is. Like they all seem to know what the problem is, but nobody's actually told me what the problem is because there was never any altercation. There was never any kind of misunderstanding. There was never any kind of anything. It was just, they stopped talking to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm supposed to fix that. And so I just keep reaching out, but I don't know what else other than maybe they expect me to apologize, but I don't even know what I'm apologizing for. Right. So I'm blessed, alhamdulillah. I mean, I asked for it. I made dua specifically because there were certain things that I felt I couldn't show up for in my life because I felt held back by what was going on. And I asked Allah for the clarity around that. So he gave me what I asked for, but huge repercussions with it. And he wouldn't have done that except that he knew I could cope with it. And I have, alhamdulillah. Um, but yeah, it can get, it, it was really messy. So don't wish too much. I think that, and the other, one more thing is like, even though those relationships get a bit um, like, you know, it's not the way you want it, you, it still doesn't affect you because you realize that you're doing the right thing. And yeah, so it, it doesn't hurt you anymore. Like, and I don't know, I'm assuming yeah, like, like my, it's not hurt, um, I don't know. Yeah, like my um, relationship, with my with my mother has been very strained you know since since then and it's been very strained because she was one of the key controllers in my life and she doesn't know how to have a relationship with me without controlling me and she can't control me anymore and so she feels uncomfortable all the time but to her it looks like it's my behavior or um, because I didn't do this or because I did say that or whatever is making her feel that way. She doesn't actually understand that it's because I'm not ac acting according to her plan. Um, but none of us are meant to act according to somebody else's plan. It's not how it works. So she's living in an, in a delusion. I can't help her with that. Like I can do my best to inspire her, encourage her, but she doesn't even listen to me anymore because she, she actually thinks I'm the one that's delusional. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really funny. Like I said to my daughter last night, cause we were having this com this actual conversation because things are popping up in my family too. Cause I made dua that this Ramadan, I was going to make the efforts to, to fix the ties of kinship. Right. So of course what happens, all the things pop to the surface and I'm looking at it all and going, I'm oh, really not quite sure how I do this. <laughs> and so my, my daughter has been dragged into the middle of it because when they can't deal with me, they try and do it through her. She's 16. It's not fair. So I was supporting her with how does she manage this? And, and I said to her jokingly, I think, I said to her, I think I must be the one that's strange because everyone seems to think I'm strange. And she just cracked up laughing because she sees me as the least strange person in the whole family <laughs> because I just behave quite sanely all the time because I don't get worked up by stuff. But anyway, enough about me. I'm just sharing that to just share the experience of this. Everyone will experience their journey differently because our journeys are all tailored by Allah perfectly for what it is that we need in order to better ourselves. If we're making dua to Allah, I want to be a better person. I want to be able to, 
you know, so for me, it was, I want to be able to set limits with my older boys and I wasn't able to, and, you know, I needed like this massive thing to happen in order to do that. Like that was the answer to my door. I was this mess in my family. Um, and that's the way it happens sometimes. Uh, everyone, it'll happen differently. Like Romy, do you have a story about one of the thing, the experiences that Allah gave you that was part of your journey? Is there something you can think of off the top of your head to share? Putting you on the spot now. Can't think of anything right now. I can, I can feel the changes, but I can't think of how it happened. I'm not not right now. I might write it down if I think of anything in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, so, so sometimes we have to reflect a while to actually connect the dots and reflect and go, oh, yeah. Um, sometimes they're not so obvious. So anyway, the point, the point of this whole class was to have hope in Allah, that anything is possible for Allah and especially for giving us and that there is always hope. And it's eight o'clock. I've been talking too long and my kids aren't ready for school and I better go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I just realized so the much. time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Homer. I'm going to have to run now. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I really appreciated this class. Thank you. You're, awesome. most, you're most welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Oh